Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. Today, as the title indicates, I'm going to be talking about my experiences at Giga Austin and what I learned while I was there. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. Those are the people who make this channel possible. First, I want to give a shout out to everyone I met while I was down there. For me, the most overwhelming and exciting part of the trip wasn't the technology part of it. It was actually meeting everybody from the community. I don't want to get too far into that because you come to me for the more technical aspect of things, but I do need to say a few words because it meant so much to me. There's far too many people to mention, so I, I kind of have to do this in bulk, but everybody who came up and gave me a hug or shook my hand or asked me to sign something or asked to take a picture of me, uh, I appreciate that a lot. It was, um, I felt the love in Austin. And on the flip side of that, I met all the major YouTube personalities that I've always wanted to meet in real life while I was down there. So it was, uh, you know, I had people coming up and talking to me and there's people that I wanted to talk to and all of them were really high bandwidth, excited conversations. And in the first four hours that I was there at the, at Clive bar in Austin, I nearly lost my voice and I was like, man, how am I going to do this for another two days? But um, there's so much energy there and so much uh, good vibes that it just kind of it pulled me through. Everyone was just as you'd expect from their YouTube videos. The only thing that kind of varied was there. A lot of times people's heights were quite a bit different than I expected. On that note, as soon as I get a video of the interview with or, or the stage event between me, Sandy Monroe and Farzad, I'll post that along with some commentary because we um, it was about 40 to 50 minutes and all three of us had a lot to say. And there was quite a few things that we just kind of skimmed the top of. So hopefully at some point we'll get the three of us together again and do a more in-depth interview. But until then, when that video comes out, I'll post it on my channel and I'll include some commentary. Some thanks are definitely in order here as well. There's, there's so many people to thank, but there's three people that I want to call out in particular, or actually four. Uh, because they're so pivotal. And those three people were Bradford Ferguson, Anwar Beck, and Matthew Tower. Without those three people, I wouldn't have even gone to Giga Texas, let alone making it to uh, the Giga Rodeo or TeslaCon. And beyond what they did for me personally, what they did for the Tesla community over three or four days in Austin was absolutely amazing. I can't believe what they were able to accomplish in a short period of time, all the events, there's oh, probably half a dozen events that they organized and they were uh, kept in contact with everybody, kept everybody up to date. And it was just overall, it was really impressive. And I hope they do more events like that in the future. Now that Austin is the global headquarters for Tesla. And the fourth person I want to thank is my brother. Without him, I might still be in New Zealand. He helped facilitate uh, my move from New Zealand to the US. He was my man on the ground here, making sure that uh, I was able to organize the house and get the loan, etc. So uh, yeah, without all these people, I wouldn't be here in the US and I wouldn't have been able to make it to, to Giga Texas. So I appreciate the community that I have around me. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do what I do. But with that all out of the way, let's get into the meat of why you're watching this video. Let's talk about the more technical aspects of Giga Austin and what I saw and experienced there. First, the factory itself was absolutely gorgeous. There was a bus ride from a staging area to Giga Austin because there was just uh, well over 10,000 people there. So they had to uh, set up staging locations off site to bring us in. And I ended up sitting next to somebody who worked at Giga Nevada and he hadn't seen the factory yet either. So we pulled up to the building and we were just both, we were surprised about how beautiful that building is. It's just this, you know, light gray, whitish concrete with uh, an inset of windows. And the way that the windows are tinted, it catches the sky. So you have this light gray and light blue, um, just this massive monolithic slab. And I've worked at factories before and they're like just corrugated steel on the outside, no windows. And this was just as such a different experience. Now that's important because if you want, you know, the best employees to work at your building, you want it, you want it to be a nice place, both outside and inside. And what those do, windows do from the inside is they give you a, a panoramic view of Austin city. 
So uh, it also opens up the space. And on top of that, the stairway leading into the building is just a broad staircase. I mean, when you look at it from uh, a drone footage, the staircase looks small, but when you're standing on that staircase, it's absolutely massive. So overall, whoever did the design for the building, my hat goes off to them because it seems like it would be a nice place to work as far as factories goes. The best way to put it is uh, the factories I've been in in the past, it kind of feels like you're entering a prison. There's narrow security gates and there's no windows and it's just, you feel trapped when you're in there. So this was so much better. Now, as you know, the factory is absolutely massive and I, I'm struggling to find a way to put into words actually how big it was. And it wasn't so much the size of the floor plate of the factory. It was the fact that it was quite a large area. Then on top of that, it was like 80 feet tall with multiple stories. One way to think of it is there was 10 to 15,000 people there and maybe maybe 20, 25 percent of the factory was actually open for people to walk through and it swallowed those 10 to 15,000 people, no problem. And there was hundreds of stands, displays, stages. There, there was multiple massive stages there. And I didn't even know which stage Elon was going to speak at until everybody started uh, flooding into one area. Another way to look at the size was a lot of people saw the drone display on TV that was going on at Giga Austin. I wasn't even aware that that was happening when it was happening because it was like something that was going on across town. I didn't see that drone display or the fireworks until I got home and watched the news. I was so focused on talking to the people, the engineers who were uh, the docents at the displays and talking to the other YouTubers that I didn't have a chance to enjoy all the entertainment that was there because they had, you know, they had people on roller skates, they had food stands, they had rides and I uh, I didn't take advantage of any of that. I was solely focused on getting information and talking to people and making connections. Now that's a good segue into what I actually learned. So let's get into it. The main takeaway is that Tesla has now delivered on most of the major promises they made at Battery Day. I've made three slides to illustrate this. The first slide is uh, the promises that they've delivered on. The second slide is things that they didn't mention at Battery Day, that, but uh, were on display at Giga Austin that were kind of above and beyond what they said at Battery Day. And the third slide is things that they still have yet to deliver on and um, some notes about the status of those. Tesla now does their cell manufacturing for the 4680 battery cell in-house. Now the machines that were on display at Austin, those machines are running and they're kind of doing test or trial production at the moment. The actual battery cells that are going into the vehicles at Austin come from the Cato Road facility, but the Austin facility won't be far behind. Now what's the significance of this? With Tesla's first vehicles, uh, or first major production vehicles, the Model S and Model X, they ordered 18650 battery cells from Japan. Those battery cells had to be shipped all the way overseas to uh, the Fremont factory where they were assembled into packs. Now they improved upon that with uh, Giga Nevada where they had 2170 battery cells produced by Panasonic and those battery cells were also built into packs at Giga Nevada. However, those battery cells in their packs had to be shipped all the way to Fremont. So there's huge logistics costs involved. And on top of the logistics costs, they also had to pay Panasonic a premium on those cells. What Tesla is doing now is they're doing the in-house 4680 battery cell manufacturing on site with no uh, additional margin cost to an, a third party. Those battery cells are being dropped directly into a structural battery pack and then dropped directly into a vehicle. It's just a beautiful symphony, as Sandy Monroe would say, of vertical integration. Now, the second point is directly related to the first. The 4680 form factor is a thing and it does have the tabless electrode. They had those battery cells on display unrolled so you could see everything that was going on inside them. As we've discussed in the past, the 4680 form factor is significant because it reduces the number of parts per vehicle. You have a larger battery cell. What the tabless electrode does is it allowed the battery cell to be made larger and still maintain good thermal characteristics, which we'll talk more about here in a second. Now, when Elon was speaking at the keynote, he said that this would be the largest battery cell factory in the world. And that makes sense because they're going to be producing the Cybertruck there, which will be extremely cell hungry. 
And on top of that, they're going to be producing the semi there, which will use, I don't know, at least five times the number of battery cells that a typical vehicle would. So I can see them needing two, three, four hundred gigawatt hours potentially in the deep future of cell production at Austin. Next, the structural battery pack. Now, one thing that I predicted before battery day was that Tesla would use plate cooling for the 4680 battery cell, uh, and that would fully maximize the utility of that tapless electrode because uh, the heat would be wicked away directly through the bottom of the battery cell. But what we've seen over the past year and what was confirmed at Austin is that the cooling ribbons that run down the side, and I did confirm this with one of the engineers there, that the, the cooling that's happening on the sides actually conducts to the bottom of the battery cell. So it is taking advantage of that tapless electrode. Now, besides the heat wicking that's going on, the tabless electrode also reduces the amount of heat generated because there's less resistance, because there's more metal. So the combination of those two things, that big chunk of metal on the bottom, and the fact that the, the cooling ribbon cools the side of the can, and that cooling conducts to the bottom of the battery cell, those two things in combination are so effective that you don't need plate cooling at the bottom. Now, one thing that people may have noticed from Giga Berlin is it appears that they're using a U-shaped cooling loop. And now that's going to be significantly better than the cooling that's currently used on the Model 3 and the Model Y. Those two vehicles, at least from the latest information I could find, the coolant passes directly through the battery pack. So you get, uh, I'd imagine you get uh, somewhat of a temperature gradient as the coolant is passing through that battery pack. With a U-shaped cooling loop, you would ha still have some temperature variability, but that U-shaped heat exchanger would help even out those hot and cool spots. Now, this isn't something I know a whole lot about. I tried to ask the engineer that I was talking to if they could give me more information, but he said it was <laughs> thermal regulation 101. So if anybody out there knows something about thermal regulation 101 and why U-shaped cooling is the best option, let me know in the comments below. It's important to keep the battery cells at a constant temperature and even temperature throughout the pack because that increases the battery life, improves performance, and increases the efficiency of the cooling system. Now, as far as the channels within the cooling ribbons, I'm assuming, as I've said, that that's a basic U-shape rather than coolant flowing in opposite directions in every other channel. Just the way that the connectors were situated, it looked like U-shaped cooling to me. Finally, the front and rear Giga castings. There was a number of people who were concerned that Tesla was having issues producing the front Giga castings, but I can confirm that the Model Ys coming out of Austin use both front and rear Giga castings. And not only that, I had a chance to talk to the engineers that were looking after those Giga casting machines, and they're working on accelerating the throughput of those Giga casting machines. This was covered in my final gigacasting video, but I'll do a quick recap here now for you. When I talked to the engineers, I asked them, all right, what is the, the rate limiting factor for these machines? And they said, well, it's, it's pulling the heat out of those castings. I said, well, so what, what can you do to accelerate that and to remove the heat more quickly? And he looked up at one machine, then looked up at the other, and he said, do you see any differences between those two machines? And as I said in my final gigacasting video, my jaw dropped because it was immediately apparent that they're using an entirely different cooling system. Generally, those gigacasting machines use a series of, they look like dehumidifiers, actually. Uh, there's just these square boxy things with coolant loops running through them. Uh, and I looked at the other machine and it was uh, the racks were pretty much empty and it was just three massive tanks. Now, I don't know how those tanks work to cool those castings. And I don't know what kind of fluid or chemical that they use to run through those cooling loops. I'm assuming it's just like a glycol or water mixture or glycol and water mixture because those have the highest heat capacity. And I'm assuming those three tanks run in three different loops to different parts of the casting machines and run through heat exchangers to um, moderate, modulate or moderate the temperature. Now that's kind of obvious, but that's, uh, that's about all I know. If I find out anything else, I'll let you know. In terms of the look of the tanks, some people have uh, said they look like liquid nitrogen tanks. And uh, after talking to a few people, that seems like it would be overly complicated, overly dangerous, and that water and glycol 
should be able to serve the purpose just well. So why, why do those tanks look like liquid nitrogen tanks? It sounds like what's most likely is because the tanks are insulated and that's all there is to it. It's not necessarily that uh, they're insulated to contain liquid nitrogen. They're just insulated to deal with the temperatures that you have to deal with in gigacasting. Now, another thing that people were concerned about was the hundreds of castings that we've seen piling up at some of Tesla's factories. And I'm not really concerned about that because uh, to me, it could be two things that we're seeing there. First, they could be just, you know, they don't necessarily need the castings yet at locations like Austin. So it's a great opportunity for them to test the machines, test new processes and push things to see what kind of performance and optimization they can get out of those machines. Now, I don't know if those castings and all the locations are still good and usable castings. However, all the hundreds of castings that I saw at Austin, they had noise, vibration, and harshness insulation on them. So it doesn't make any sense to me that they would put that insulation on those castings if they weren't going to go in those vehicles and if they were just going to scrap them. So at least the castings in Austin, it looks like they're going to be used. Now let's move on to the, uh, the bonus points for Tesla's engineering team. Things that weren't covered at Battery Day, but that I saw at Giga Austin that were really exciting to me. First is safer battery packs. The way they've done that is they've designed holes in the bottom of the battery cells and weak points. So if there is an overpressure event in those battery cells and they burst into flames, that flame ejecta is forced downwards rather than up into the passenger compartment. Now, another thing that the engineer said that was interesting to me was that the structural battery pack itself is inherently safer. Now, I wasn't able to get any more information out of him, but I'm assuming it's because there's less steel in that structural battery pack, and that allows more flame retardant epoxy foam to be stuffed into it. So with more flame retardant epoxy foam instead of steel, uh, you can absorb more energy. That's my guess. But if anybody else out there has a better guess, let me know. The second thing worth noting is the seat integration with the structural battery pack. This is this is going to do so much to streamline Tesla's manufacturing process. Generally, seats have to be awkwardly shoehorned into the sides of the vehicle. With this, those seats can be mounted directly to the structural battery pack and just lift it up into the bottom. Now, I'm sure that there's a lot more that Tesla isn't telling us about the technology that's in the 4680 battery cell and uh, everything that they're doing with their vehicle and body engineering. But those were two great takeaways that I was really happy to say. Um, now, on the safer battery pack thing, that's not to say that 2170 battery packs that they currently use are unsafe. They're most definitely safer than sitting on a tank of gasoline. However, Tesla, whenever they roll out an improvement to their vehicles, they move to a next generation of the technology, they're always trying to make those vehicles safer. And I'd be curious to know how these nickel-based battery packs now compare to the safety of something like an LFP battery pack. Because I don't want to call it the holy grail, but uh, one goal for batteries is to be both high energy density and safe. And if Tesla can achieve safety without something like solid state, do they need to move to solid state in the future? I, I think they eventually will, but this, this allows them to put off moving to a solid state and waiting for the best technology until, I don't know, deeper into the 2020s, possibly into the 2030s. And one more note on safety, uh, Elon did note on stage that the Giga castings are safer than a typical stamped steel body. Again, one of Tesla's main focuses is on the safety of the people in the vehicles, which I just love to see as a, a value that they place on human life that other auto manufacturers, um, it seems like they're just trying to pass regulatory hurdles. So what are we still waiting on confirmation from, from battery day? Uh, the first is the dry battery electrode. Now, I'm assuming that these battery cells have the dry battery electrode. Uh, Tesla has been keeping us up to date on that in the earnings calls, and I'm looking forward to getting a hold of one of these cells and tearing it down. Now, if they don't have a dry battery electrode, that's not the end of the world, but it would be quite a coup because there's quite a few people that are still saying that a dry battery electrode is impossible. Second, we need confirmation that these batteries are cobalt free. Once again, I need to wait for a battery cell to tear it down to find out if that's the case. Now, in terms of the actual chemistry of these battery cells that are coming off the line, 
I'm assuming they're going to be high nickel battery cells, but I don't know if they're going to be high manganese as well. So that is something like 70% nickel and 30% manganese. I'm hoping that's the case because Tesla can stretch their nickel supply 50% further if they add 30% manganese. And nickel is going to be one of the bottlenecks that Tesla runs into in the next few years. Next, once again, I need a teardown for this, and that's the silicon anode for high energy density. Uh, and, and on the topic of energy density, if these battery cells are high manganese, the energy density will suffer slightly, but it'll still be higher than the 2170 battery cells that go into Tesla's current Model 3 and Model Y. I'm guessing it'll be something like 270 to 280 watt hours per kilogram if they're using high manganese, which is just a little bit higher than the, I think it's around 260, 263 watt hours per kilogram in their current 2170 battery cells. And that's definitely worth it from my perspective to be able to create more battery cells and get more vehicles on the road. Now they will need to use a high nickel chemistry, of course, for the Tesla Semi and Cybertruck because those are weight sensitive vehicles and performance sensitive vehicles. Now, I think the next big thing that we're going to see in terms of construction, and Joe Tegmeyer is documenting this in his YouTube videos, is the cathode factory. The cathode factory will take lithium, nickel, and other chemicals and combine them to make the powder that goes into the battery cell factory to coat the electrodes in the battery cells. And after that, we I hope to see a lithium factory. I think the cathode factory will be built this year, and the lithium factory, I think, well, I'm hoping that that lithium factory is built next year, so long as they have the raw mined materials to go into that lithium factory. Now, in terms of the lithium clay, that's something completely separate. As I've said in the past, I think if they do do lithium clay mining, and I've done a video on that, it's probably going to be late 2020s before we see something like that. However, with the noises that Elon's making around lithium and raw materials, I could very well be wrong, and I hope I am wrong. Lastly, will the performance of these battery cells meet expectations? Tesla did set some expectations at battery day, which is what they're, uh, they're going to increase the range significantly. And I've said, as I've said in the past, I think that's going to gradually happen over time. However, there is an expectation that I personally had that these battery cells will be able to achieve higher cycle life. So once again, I need to get a hold of one of these battery cells, tear it down and get a feel for what we're looking at. Now, a lot of people in my GigaCasting finale video, they asked me about the 279 mile range, standard range, all wheel drive Model Y coming out of Austin. We do know that it's using the 4680 battery cell. That's been confirmed. Uh, we do know that uh, it'll be a nickel chemistry. So uh, this battery pack, it won't be LFP despite some of the rumors. There's been no indication from Elon and there's been no indication from any sources that this would be an LFP battery pack or a battery pack from CATL. I think the reason why people are speculating that it's an LFP battery is because of the weight of the vehicle and the low efficiency. Now, personally, I think those figures are wrong. I think we're going to see a teardown of this vehicle and it's going to be different than what we see on screen. Uh, errors are occasionally made in these documentations. And also th there, there's a chance that Tesla sandbagged this vehicle. They've done that before with past vehicles, or it could be that they left a buffer in that battery pack, or they've decided to possibly open it up at a later date to software unlock some of that battery pack. Regardless, all this information here, Besides being nickel and 4680, I don't trust it. Uh, the 82 kilowatt hours, for instance, uh, the five years ahead YouTube channel did a, a great analysis of the, the battery pack that we saw. And it looks like they're going to be able to vary the amount of battery cells in that pack by taking buffers off the sides or inserting buffers on the sides of the battery pack. That's instead of inserting dumb, dummy cells like I suggested in the past. The, the buffer method, adding those spacers in, makes a lot more sense than dummy cells. I'll leave a link to that video in the description. Now, the Tesla economist has been following this closely as well. He's done several videos on this 279 mile range Model Y, and I'll link uh, one of those videos in the description as well. Overall, my takeaway here is that I don't trust this information and I'm waiting to see an actual teardown or better data because in order to make this work out logically, I'd have to alter multiple fields, not just one. In summary, everything that Tesla said they were going to do at battery day, the things that were the most important on a shorter time horizon, they're doing. And in fact, they're doing a little bit more because of what we saw with pack safety and the seat mounting directly to the structural battery pack. 
Now, some people have said that the 4680 battery cell appears to be behind schedule, and I'm sure Tesla would like to be further along with where they're at with the 4680 cell production uh, in terms of uh, the production ramp. But ultimately, as I've said in past videos, I don't think it really matters a whole lot at this point, because right now Tesla is chip constrained rather than cell constrained. And beyond that, Tesla has put into place multiple suppliers and ask them to increase their cell output to make up for any shortcomings with the 4680 battery cell line. So yeah, as Elon said, this year it's about chips. Next year, it'll be about that cell production. So they really, throughout this year, they really need to ramp those 4680 battery cell production lines. And um, I'll be keeping an eye on that. At the moment, the amount of battery cells that they're getting from Kato Road, uh, Mind the last we saw it was about a million battery cells, which is enough for about 1,200 vehicles. Now, I've also heard rumors that they've now hit, or they're going to hit soon, 2 million battery cells out of Kato Road. That would be enough for about 2,500 vehicles. At Austin, I don't think we've seen that many vehicles produced yet, so it doesn't look like the 4680 battery cell is actually bottlenecking vehicle production at Austin. In fact, I think... It's not a big concern of mine because at Austin, you have a new vehicle architecture and a new factory with a new new workforce. So I do think that that vehicle production line may ramp more slowly than what we've seen at Shanghai. The Shanghai Gigafactory was, uh, for the Model Y at least, was kind of a cut and paste of Fremont. And so was the Model 3 line, whereas Austin is something altogether new. It's, it's an evolution. It's a Model Y 2.0. So once again, chips this year, cell production next year, they really need to get those 4680 battery cell lines humming by the end of this year and early next year. And after that, for me, it's all about raw materials. And I have some additional thoughts on that. I've been doing quite a bit of thinking since my battery news number one video. And soon here, I want to share additional thoughts about how Tesla could tackle the material supply challenge. And I do think I'm pretty sure now that Elon is going to include something about mining in Master Plan Part 3. Now, panning back on Austin and looking at Tesla more broadly as a manufacturing machine, what I walked away with from Austin was that nobody is close to what Tesla is doing in manufacturing. There's quite a few other companies saying they're going to do this, so they're going to do that. They're lining up cathode suppliers, uh, they're lining up battery suppliers, uh, they're thinking about doing giga castings, etc. But nobody is doing that currently. It's all some abstract date in the future where they plan on doing these things. And Tesla is doing it right now. They're doing it today. They're uh, using the giga castings, the structural battery pack, and battery cell production in-house to have this full vertical integration stack in one factory, and they're just going to keep growing and they're going to keep expanding their sphere of influence. They're going to be the largest player in the game. And I think with raw materials, we're going to start seeing that play out in the next few years. I think Tesla is going to have their hands in all the raw materials pies. So I'll, I'll discuss that more in another video, but yeah, it's, it's been said so many times. It's, it's game over for uh, other auto manufacturers. And I'm going to be interested to see which ones survive. But that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you got something out of it. This confirms a lot of what we've been talking about in the past 18 months. So it was a, uh, it was really satisfying experience for me. Tesla is of course doing an earnings call this week. And after the earnings call, I'm sure there's going to be plenty to talk about and I'll do a video covering off the earnings call. Once again, that's all for today. Thanks for tuning in.